to the SHG Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar series Geophysics for Today and Tomorrow. I'm Aurelian Röser, Chair of the SHG Europe Regional Advisory Committee, and together with my Vice Chair, Emin Sadikov, I will serve as your host for today's webinar titled Geophysics in Support of Offshore Engineering. Um, before we begin with the talk, the model for this webinar will be a short presentation followed by a questions and answers session. If you have any questions or comments regarding today's talk, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenter today is Mark Vardy. Mark obtained a master's in physics and astronomy and a PhD in marine geophysics. After his PhD, he stayed in academia as a research fellow and principal scientist before co-founding Sand Geophysics. Mark has worked on all matters of offshore projects from inshore infrastructure developments to large scale offshore renewables installations. He specializes in the development of novel high-resolution geophysical solutions to marine near-surface problems. Among other accomplishments, he was a co-inventor of the 3D Chirp Decimeter Resolution 3D Seismic System, has designed a multi-channel seismic streamer in collaboration with Geometrics, and developed two specialist seismic software packages specifically designed to provide optimal qualitative and quantitative imagery from high-resolution seismic reflection data. So without further ado, we welcome our presenter, Mark, the stage is yours. Thanks, Erlian, and, and thanks to Amin and uh, SEG as well. And um, I guess for those of you in Europe, good afternoon. And for those of you in North America, good morning. Um, I will just start the presentation. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining. Firstly, um, thank you to everybody for turning up. Um, I will today I'm going to be talking about geophysics in support of offshore engineering um, and particularly uh, with a focus towards offshore new renewables projects, which is a, a pretty hot topic at the moment with a huge amount of, of effort going into them as part of the, the global energy transition. I thought it would be useful to start by kind of summarizing what a, a kind of a, a typical modern offshore site investigation um, looks like uh, in uh, terms of the offshore renewables sector, just because I, I imagine there's probably going to be quite a lot of people from a range of different specialities and backgrounds uh, joining today. So um, <clears throat> just to make sure we're all kind of coming from the same starting point, um, for most modern offshore site investigation ground models in the offshore renewables sector are, are built basically using two different types of observations. So you have the geophysical observations, which are typically 2D, sometimes you with localized 3D seismic reflection data, and these would typically be relatively short offset seismic reflection data. And then this is complemented with geotechnical observations from a, a combination of um, both seafloor and um, seafloor and um, borehole geotechnical um, samples. So you then get basically co-penetrometer data and also laboratory analysis from samples taken at geotechnical boreholes. Those two different sources of information then can be combined together to build your ground model. Typically, the geophysical observations are still generally only used to interpret and create a kind of unitized 3D structural model. And then the actual ground conditions, the actual soil properties are then painted across these units using soil parameters derived from the geotechnical observations. So this can either be in terms of generalized soil units or it can be in, in terms of gradient based interpolated soil parameters. There's a number of questions that kind of come out from that. I mean, one of the critical ones I think that I think that's often asked is, is that an optimal use of all of the resources that we have um, available to us? Um, and the honest answer really is, is obviously a no. I think the any sort of intrafascies architecture present within the seismic reflection data that tells us things like the variation in um, dip in structure such as in the the dipping beds in the image shown in the center here or the complexity within some of this this deeper kind of complex fascies or the variation in in change in thickness of bedding of this kind of layered unit at the bottom of that section all of that level of information is kind of is lost so even on a qualitative sense the intra, intra fascist information we have about variability in bedding or um, and sorting of material 
doesn't get preserved and, and uh, passed on to later project phases if all we do is take structural boundaries and then map that into a model. The image on screen just kind of illustrates really what we're what we're doing if that's the approach we take to building our ground model. So the, the left section so it shows a section of actually boomer data, single channel boomer data from a, a wind farm site that's it's all presented as two a time below the sea floor, which is kind of like the 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 domain of the ground model. In the middle is the unitization that we've interpreted. So here that we've just picked uh, five units. I mean, we could pick quite a few more there if we wanted to, but here we picked five units. And then on the right hand side, essentially, is the seismic data formed only from those unit boundaries. So you compare those two seismic sections, you get a sense as to just how much information is being thrown away if we don't use all of that intrafascies architecture. So from a qualitative point of view, it makes much more sense to use it and to use that to better inform the spatial variability uh, in the structure. Uh, but also, if we can get at quantitative information, we can use that to look at the spatial variability in the ground conditions as well. And that's kind of the point, really, of what I'm coming at with this talk. This image here put together by NGI for some work we did together on um, HKW, uh, sorry, HKZ, um, shows um, just some ex uh, example of the pro one of the problems in terms of trying to stitch this together into a, a coherent ground model. You, know, you have this laterally continuous geophysical data and these very complicated 1D um, geotechnical observations and how you're going to realistically interpolate data to capture the variability in ground conditions between those those one dimensional geotechnical locations is extremely difficult to do. Um, but if you can leverage some of that spatial variability from the geophysical data, then you can flatten the uncertainty curve as you move away from those 1D sample locations. And so that's kind of the point really I want to talk about today is trying to move the ground models that we build from for offshore renewables projects move them forward in a way that means we're we're <laughs> leveraging more information from the the geophysical data and supporting the geotechnical um, work as it moves forward so a key part i think of doing that though is is to understand the questions or the questions that the engineers are seeking to answer and it would be easy to just think that that's a very simple question in terms of what are the ground conditions at the location or the locations of interest and that location or locations could be either your uh, wind off offshore wind turbine foundation locations it could be the spud can locations for a jackup rig that you're bringing in it could be a the location along which the route along which you're laying a cable or a pipeline but the reality is actually, I think, that critically, the question that the engineers are, are actually most interested in is subtly broader than that. And I, I think actually a better summary of the sort of question that they're really interested in answering is what's the probable range of ground conditions at the location or locations of interest? Um, so they're not necessarily wanting to get a handle on what the value of a particular of a single value of a property is at any location or depth but rather what they want to understand is what's the likely range in values because that way then you can use that to look at what the lowest possible say strength is and use that to influence your foundation design or you can take for example the upper bound the highest likely strength and use that to understand the influence on the drivability of putting in your pile for your foundation. So it's really actually more about trying to understand the potential range in properties than the single values. And so that's a key point to remember and take forward, I think, as we're going through. And I'll come back to it throughout the talk because it's come, it basically means that getting some understanding of the uncertainty in any predictions we make is really quite important. Um, and even if we don't can't necessarily get the perfect absolute value from any kind of inversions and predictions that we make, if we can get some sense of the uh, variability on those predictions and the uncertainty of them, then that 
actually can be a useful outcome for the engineers when it comes to to moving into the next phase so what i want to do with the talk really is break it down i suppose kind of into two sections so that the first section i want to think um more about the very early phase um of a of an offshore renewables project. Um, so kind of early phase characterizations, you might think of it as kind of the scoping phase or leading into the pre-feed. And then the second phase will come into more detail and think more about the kind of the design phase. So when it really comes into answering detailed questions about designing the infrastructure that's going to going to be put in place. The reason for separating them out is the sorts of questions that are being asked and the requirements that are asked for the kind of earlier scoping um, phases are, are much higher level and uh, much more generic. Questions that are such as, you know, what is the current environment? So what's the current water depth? Um, what's the um, current met ocean um, environment? All of that influences essentially the, the range of um, foundations or the range of um, installation techniques which are viable. What's the expected ground conditions likely to be? Just in a broad sense, um, what are the geohazards that are expected to be present and, and how might they be mitigated? So, for example, you know, could you uh, do you have uh, crystalline bedrock coming up very near to the subsurface and therefore you might mitigate it by simply avoiding that part of the site questions like that that are are relatively high level but important ones to be able to answer because they can then be used to essentially lock in key decisions early on in the project phase um, particularly when the answers to these questions are then cast in terms of the implications for the engineering concept design. You can then potentially rule out certain foundation types or certain installation methods as just not being feasible or certain parts of the site as just not being feasible. So I again, think the bottom line really in the early phases of projects is the more information you can get, then the better. And so sometimes getting a little bit of extra information can be even a relatively simple bit of extra information can be really, really useful. Um, the What I'm showing on screen and I'll show over the next couple of slides is a really good example of just doing a little bit of extra work with the geophysical data and uh, how much extra information that can actually tell you uh, in terms of um, in this case geohazards and geohazard mitigation and understanding you know what are the likely geohazards and, and and what you might need to do about them so you know bright spots or soft kicks as they're sometimes termed um, within geophysical data um, have a habit of ringing alarm bells within projects because they very often people see bright spots within the data and, and it just gets tagged as well, okay, there's a possibility you've got free gas there in the subsurface. Um, and the, you know, the risks associated with free gas mean that, um, you know, offshore, so it tends to, you know, bring lots of alarm bells, the risks go up. And, um, you know, there are, are many of offshore projects that have been basically scuttled because of the, there's been, free possible gas identified within the geophysical data the reality is that not that there's lots and lots of ways of creating these sorts of high amplitude bright spot anomalies within geophysical data and so if we can do a little bit more that helps us pin down what the causes of those bright spots are is it like is it actually free gas or is it something else then that can really help in terms of uh, understanding and mitigating those risks and of course this can all be done at very, you know, if you've got early stage scoping geophysical data you can look at it just as well within that data as you can within your later you know design phase really detailed geophysical data so highlighting it early on has lots of benefits here we've got a um a little bit of spark and multi-channel data from the southern north sea um, the red dashed line is the sea floor the yellow dashed line is the base holocene surface and you can see associated with that base holocene surface there's a series of bright spots that are in this these data are mapped throughout the study area what's interesting is if you look at them in a bit more detail and even if even just qualitatively <clears throat> what you see actually there's very little evidence in the way of attenuation beneath them so 
just from qualitatively looking at those them in terms of um, their architecture and their impact on the underlying seismic, you're starting to question actually, well, is that an indicator of free gas? Because you you don't have any obvious attenuation um, of, of the underlying structure. If we combine that with a bit of extra data and then just do a little bit of extra work with it, then we can basically practically rule out those as being signatures of free gas um, completely. So the second panel here, the, the, the lower seismic panel shows a bit of coincidence of bottom profiler data bit higher resolution as, than the sparker and so there what we start to see is we see that actually this is a complex wavelet we've got a top and a bottom reflection that are overlapping um, and it's actually more indicative of a thin layer just a little bit of simple reflectivity modeling of that shows that actually <coughs> we can create a very simple uh, we can get create a very similar response by having a very small negative reflectivity kick sitting on top of much larger positive reflectivity kick now that those reflectivity changes that we're seeing there they're not large enough to indicate free gas presence in the subsurface what it actually is more indicative of is a switch from coarser grained open marine sands near the sea floor to finer grained possibly um finer grained kind of overbank or near shore material at the base sitting on top of a of a, of a coarse grained um, erosional surface that's the base holocene so what we've actually got there is a thin layer of fine grained material it's these these um geospatially these bright spots are sitting kind of near the edges of channels so it's actually probably fine grained overbank material um possibly there may be some organics in there so you might be thinking of, okay there might be a bit of peat but you know there's no evidence within this data to rule that in or out but it dramatically changes the geohazards that you're you're thinking of then you're not thinking free gas you're looking at something else and so just a little bit of extra information provides quite a, a little bit of extra work sorry provides quite a bit of extra information in terms of understanding the ground the likely ground conditions and you know suddenly these sorts of features then they become less important from the point of view of say planning foundations but more important from the point of view of thinking about cables because if you've got fine-grained potentially overbank peat layers then suddenly thermally you're changing the environment that you're putting your cable into and um you're then changing the uh, potentially the the behavior and the longevity of your your high voltage cable so it's subtle changes and it's just a little bit of extra work but it can make quite a big difference if we wanted to do a bit more with early phase geophysical data then what then um what we have to recognize is that very often the early phase geophysical data is somewhat limited Quite often it involves single channel seismic and sub bottom profiler. Sometimes you get a very coarse grid of, of, of multi channel 2D seismic, but um, not always. What that means is that if we want to try and get a bit more quantitative information out of these data in the early phase, then processing is a bit limited. And essentially, we're limited to just looking at getting compression away properties, so acoustic impedance and attenuation, really. Um, so it's not ideal in that we can't get that it's very difficult or it's very unlikely we'll be able to get at shear wave properties directly. But um, you, when used together, acoustic impedance and attenuation are sensitive to different soil parameters. So we can actually use them um, together uh, in conjunction to provide some very useful high level information. Uh, and on, so on the, the next slide, I'm just going to um, outline very briefly kind of at a high level how we do that and that's a, a one way of doing that so this slide's quite complicated there's quite a lot of things going on here but um essentially what we're doing is on the left two panels we're taking some geophysical data and we're plotting them on top of a geotechnical plot so the left two panels show uh, a robertson soil classification chart uh, with uh, each of the coloured zones indicating a different soil classification. The, the, the little coloured blobs sitting on top of that are the geophysical data. And on the left plot, 
they're colored based on Q factor, so based on attenuation. And on the right plot, they're colored based on impedance. And there's some scattering there, but there are some broad trends that we can see. So if we look at the Q factor, for example, what we find is that cooler colors, so as you go into kind of the, like the, the greens and the blues tend to plot down towards the bottom right of the plot. So that's then into the fine grained part of the soil classification chart. The warmer colors, so particularly as you get into the oranges and reds, you plotting up in the top right so you're getting into the more granular the coarse grained part of that soil classification chart with impedance the behavior is slightly different so with impedance in the middle plot the yellows and the reds tend to plot more down towards the bo bottom of the chart so more in the fine grained and uh, lower levels of consolidated material whereas the greens and, and into the blues tend to plot up in the the top part of that chart. So as you're going then into the fine grained, uh, in, sorry, into the coarse grained and the, the more consolidated material. So if we flip that plot on its head and instead of plotting geophysical data on a geotechnical plot, we plot geotechnical data on a geophysical plot. So that's what we're doing on the right. So on the right hand side, we're plotting Q factor along the X axis and impedance up the right hand side. And what we see there is that there's a nice clustering between granular soils. So that's the kind of like the the the, the pale greens and the um, the browny orangey colours and the cohesive colours. So the darker browns and the 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 blues. So there, there's a nice kind of clustering and separation between essentially sands and clays. And then also we can dig into that data more. We can also see that within those two zones, you tend to get sort of compaction trends within it. So within the sands in particularly, you get a relatively clear compaction trend as you're going from the lower left part of that cluster so at low cues and lower impedances with less dense loose sands moving up through to higher cues and higher impedances as you move into denser sands so essentially uh, as the sand becomes more compacted it becomes harder for the grains to move relative to each other so you then you get less attenuation because there's less freedom for the, the grain skeleton and the storm and the, the uh, poor fluids to move independently, but also it's denser, so you get higher impedances. So you, your Q factor goes up and your impedance goes up. For the clays, it's a bit more complicated because you get lots of variability in Q factor depending on whether it's uh, on how, how the clay is being deposited in what environment and how clean the clay is. Um, but there's still a general trend. I think with clays, generally, it's about an increasing impedance that, that controls the kind of stiffness of the clay. Um, and so we can use that to try and relate impedance and Q factor um, to the level of compaction uh, of the soils. And, and they would, so I guess actually we can step back from that. Sorry. So we can use that in two ways with relatively high level data um, and without necessarily having a need for, for lots of calibration data. First thing we can do is we can use the, the impedance and Q factor and those clusters to be able to, um, um, we, we've, we can use those um, clusters to be able to separate out um, which layers are behaving in a cohesive manner um, and which layers are behaving in a more granular manner. Um, and on top of that, we can then also, particularly with the sand layers, where there's a, a, a quite nice trend between variations in Q and impedance and density, we can then look at, at variation from a loose to a very dense sand. And so this data we see here is essentially showing an example of that from a, a data from the Southern North Sea. So we've got, um, it's mostly sand section. There's a one layer that's definitely clay near the kind of around about 80 milliseconds to a time, but above and below it, it's sand dominated. And so you can then see that we've separated the sand out into five, five kind of classifications from loose sand, which is yellows, through oranges into greens, which are very dense sands. And on top of that data, we've then overlaid the same sort of classification, but based on CPT tip resistance results. So and you can see there's a pretty good agreement between those two data sets. So we've been able to, to identify that the, the shallow layers are, are broadly loose sands. There's some 
um, I guess medium dense to dense sands sitting just beneath that. And then you've predominantly got a, a thick sequence of very dense sands. And we, we with some, some um, dense sands, beneath it so we uh, we we actually pick that out quite nicely within the geophysical data so certainly as a high level indicator of variability in soil conditions that you could use from say you know high level scoping data sets that that are just trying to get a handle on what's the large scale variability in the ground conditions across a site well there's a lot of information within that 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 can be really useful just to understand you know how what's the variation in is it is it is it sand dominated is it clay dominated is it lots of fine gray is it lots of loose sands or do we get is it mostly kind of very 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 hard sands so there's quite a bit there that we can do i think just by pushing the early phase data a little bit more and getting a little bit more information out of it, sometimes just from some simple extra analysis and sometimes from doing a bit of inversion and doing some quite high level predictions based on those. If we move on to the second part of the talk, though, and think about the kind of the design phases of projects, then the requirements there are, are much more detailed. Um, here, we're really looking at having a need to build a, a much more de detailed understanding of the ground conditions at, at specific infrastructure locations. And we need to be able to do that in terms of key engineering parameters that directly influence the engineering design. Um, there's no point in just providing you know, geophysical parameters at this phase. There's no point in, in say, providing really high resolution, a high fidelity velocity or uh, P wave velocity or she wave velocity or attenuation um, models um, because the engineers don't really know what they mean. So if we're going to be useful in supporting the engineers at this phase of a project, then we need to be able to convert those geophysical parameters into engineering parameters. And that's the really kind of the key challenge at this phase uh, of the project. The good thing, though, as you move on into the later phases is that the data becomes higher quality and more comp comprehensive. So we can do more with the geophysical data. Um, we you know, standardly for um, offshore renewables projects now is they will be 2D and increasingly, most projects I think now there's there's also is 3D multi-channel high resolution seismic data acquired as well. Um, typically the 3D is a limited extent. So quite often you tend to get either narrow corridors of it or kind of small postage stamp volumes of it targeting specific areas. But there is, there is 3D being acquired. Um, offset ranges are still a bit limited. Rarely we get them larger than 100 metres. So obviously, as the water depths get deeper, you get more limited in terms of what you can do with that data. But there's more of it and there's there's more. Um, uh, and, the, and so there's more, there are more we can do. Um, and also there's lots of, of, of other data as well um, becomes available as you get later into a project phase. So there is lots of CPTs and boreholes that we can then tie that geophysical data into to help, help us characterize those ground conditions better. So it really does become a game of, of integration at this phase of a project um, rather than just trying to leverage a bit more information from the geophysical data. I'm not going to dwell an awful lot on the seismic inversion in, in this talk because there isn't really time. Um, what I'm going to uh, really focus on is how we go from the geophysical parameters into the geotechnical parameters and different ways we can do that and, and essentially look at how far we can push that and, and different ways we can do it that are, are of interest. Um, what I would say in terms of the seismic inversion is that there's that all, all kind of all of the more kind of common approaches to seismic inversion can and have been applied to these data, whether you're thinking about the simplest form of kind of seismic inversion, as we see on the left of the screen, so acoustic impedance inversion. Um, we can look at applying elastic impedance inversions we see in the middle. 
And we can also go all the way to the right hand side where we look at elastic full waveform inversion. Particularly as you get into elastic full waveform inversion, there's lots of different ways in which you can cast that. And there are ways we can squeeze more out of the data, even if your offset range relative to your water depth is not ideal. So the example shown here, we, we cast the waveform inversion in terms of impedance and Poisson's ratio, which stabilizes it much more if you're dealing with a, a, a kind of a, a limited offset range data and it can produce really nice results. Um, there's you know key challenges with trying to do any of that with these data, particularly with the elastic and the full waveform inversion and, and receiver ghosts, which I've noticeably left in on these data samples here, can become really challenging to deal with. Um, and, and they have to be dealt with one way or another either you know by suppression or by implicitly including it within the forward modeling in the inversion um but they, it is tractable and so we have options for a very of various options to be able to invert our geophysical data and derive geophysical properties from it be that simple acoustic impedance be that acoustic and, and shear wave impedance or be that getting into more complex parameters like separating out density or Poisson's ratio, etc. The challenge, like I said, though, is going from those properties into the geotechnical properties, the engineering properties that, we, that we're really interested in, that the engineers really want to know. Um, and I think most of the, the recent interest within industry in terms of solving that uh, has essentially been based around combining those seismic inversion techniques with machine learning uh, to derive synthetic CPTs. Um, and there's a number of reasons I think that's been particularly looked at lots and used quite a bit is um, I think you know one of the reasons is that it's very easy to compare it against standard methods. So a more traditional approach to generating synthetic CPTs and kind of propagating um, CPT parameters around um, between your isolated 1D locations are to use these gradient-based synthetic CPTs, so gradient-based um, interpolation, which simplifies the, the CPT response to essentially average values with depth trends and spatial trends within each layer. And then you can then associate with that um, uncertainty bounds, so upper and lower uncertainty bounds. And that's what we see on the left image here. So this is data from HKZ, where uh, a kind of gradient-based synthetic CPT has been generated. Um, the solid lines are the best fit value and the dashed lines are the upper and lower bound. So we compare that with the machine learning output for that same location. We can see the improvement in terms of the fidelity of the model that we've been able to, to produce. And we also see that there's a, um, in this case, it's been able, there's been an improvement in reliability. One of the issues with this synthetic CPT, the gradient based synthetic CPT in this case was that initially the, the clay layer between 25 and 30 meters below sea floor wasn't included in the initial layering and so for that unit then trying to fit a gradient through a layer that actually includes 15 meters of sand and five meters of clay is a very difficult task and what you end up with is a is a, an average value and a gradient that's not really representative of either but whereas using that machine learning because we're throwing more parameters at it and it's kind of being data data driven it is captured that quite nicely another advantage of this is that we can use or make the most of the smorgasbord of machine learning approaches that are available uh, and, the, the, and use the appropriate method that's um, best for that particular project um, and for that particular data so you you know you can vary the the uh, the specific machine learning approach you choose based on the input data quality and that that includes both the geophysical and the geotechnical data you can um, vary depending on the sample size so how much how much data you've got to train your machine learning on um, and also the project requirements you know, do you need a really highly detailed prediction or is a slightly simpler higher level prediction actually appropriate for that project certainly in the current project phase um, and we see examples of that here so I've given two examples the, the example on the left is a, is a classification using a, a random forest algorithm 
where we're essentially binning the tip CPT tip resistance, sleeve friction and, and pore pressure into, into discrete uh, bins uh, and using the random forest algorithm to basically predict which bin, uh, whichever depth the that the response is deemed to be most likely. Um, on the right hand side, we're using a, an artificial neural network or an ensemble of artificial neural networks to do a continuous prediction. So this is a, a regression and it's essentially trying to generate a fully smoothed synthetic CPT response for tip resistance, um, sleeve friction and pore pressure. Uh, on the plot on the right, the black line is the, the obs observation from that location. The red line is the um, is the best prediction. And the shaded gray uh, range is the uh, essentially is the prediction envelope. So we're using an ensemble of predictions here um, to then try and capture the uncertainty or the variability in that prediction. And it get, comes back to the point I made at the beginning about trying to understand the range of likely values rather than the single value. If we use the, that smorgasbord of machine learning approaches appropriately, we can get some sense of not just, you know, what the values are, whether that's a class or whether that's a, you know, an, an absolute value from a regression, but we can also associate some level of, of uncertainty or very, that capture the variability with that. So um, in terms of the regressions on the right hand side, while we can generate that best prediction, that red line, I think actually the most useful output from that is the, is the shaded um, prediction envelope, which captures the upper and lower limits of it. I think another reason as well why, why, um, Synthetic CPTs are a, a useful, are, are, are being used quite a lot as well, is because of it's. There's lots of ways in which you can look at trying to analyze them and um, and essentially look at trying to quantify the fitness of the method, try and quantify the performance of the the predictions. Um, I think probably the most common approach is to use a, a, a leave one out cross validation style approach. So where essentially for any given site, you train your neural network using input data from all sites bar one, and then you blindly predict the the response at that at that location in which you left out of the training data. And then by comparing that result against the actual intrusive um, CPT data, you can then look in, in quite some detail about the behavior of the of your predictions, how it's capped capturing certain transitions, how it's capturing both the long wavelength trend or the fine detailed variability. And we see that here in the um, in this these data from the, the North Sea, where the red line is the, the um, real data and the black line is the best prediction and the shaded gray region is the, conf is the confidence interval based on that prediction for kind of three control points. So in each of these cases, we were the network was trained using all the other data and then blindly predicted into this control point. Um, and what's, you know, by doing it in this way, you can then really kind of pull apart and look at the importance of, of individual sites for capturing particular soil conditions. So, for example, in control point three, what you'll notice is that there's a very sharp drop in tip resistance around about 15, 14 and a half, 15 metres below the sea floor. That layer there is not captured in any of the ground in any of the other ground condition locations, and so it's really poorly predicted in terms of the CPT synthetic CPT prediction there. So you can kind of you know look in great detail if you do it this way, but what you can also do is step back and conduct kind of site wide statistical analysis. So that kind of comparison between say the predicted and the measured tip resistance or sleeve friction, uh, you can. You can combine that across all of your sites. So do a leave one out for all of your geotechnical locations and then um, and look at that. And you can either plot that as kind of histograms, as we see in the top row here, or you can plot that as kind of heat maps, as we see in the in the bottom row. The thing to note about those heat maps is do take notice of the log scale on the counts. So, for example, with the sleeve friction, although it looks there is quite a bit of scatter, the, there's actually two orders of magnitude between, in terms of number of data points per cell, uh, between the the kind of pale kind of um, 
cream colours that are distributed some distance from the one to one line and the much stronger or ready orange colours that are focused around the one to one line. But like I say, I think that I think that the key and the most useful output from any of these is is actually that envelope of parameters being able to specify an upper and lower bound. And so actually of all of these statistics, I think that the, probably the most useful is the middle row on that plot, which is essentially looking at the percentage of measured data points that fall within the predicted envelope. And so for this particular site, with these particular data, we see that uh, in excess of 70% of the, the measurements fall within the predicted envelope across all of the, in this case, 90 locations in which we did a leave one out analysis for. So what that suggests is that the the envelopes are doing a very good job in capturing the variability. And if you pass those on then to an engineer, they can then think about, say, well, actually, I want to add a little bit more. I want to add a bit of a buffer zone onto that. So I could add plus or minus 10 percent. You do that, say, with tip resistance. Essentially, you're in excess of 90 percent of your of your measurement values would fall within that, that envelope then. So that envelope, I, I do think, is probably the critical output. Now, of course, we can do that process wherever we have geophysical data. So we can use it in lots of different ways, depending on particular projects and what the requirements for those projects are, what we need to know. So we can use it, for example, to generate laterally continuous profiles across specific areas of interest. And this is an example from a cable project where there was active scouring uh, and so the, there was interest in capturing the spatial variability in the soil conditions to understand what was controlling scouring and how we could mitigate it moving forward. So we generated this 2D um, profile of tip resistance um, through the area of interest and then from that it could be processed in a you know, normal way turning CPG tip resistance into a relative density plot. And so that then could be fed straight into uh, a scour uh, modeling analysis. And then it could be used then to look at ways in which to mitigate the, for this short kind of couple of kilometer long section of the cable route, you know, how to mitigate the scouring there. But of course, you can step that up and you can kind of scale that however you want. So if you're wanting to look at it from a, you know, for some projects, you'd want to look at it as a whole ground model, like kind of whole offshore renewable zone ground model perspective. And this is what we did where together with NGI and the example shown here. So this is a, a, an offshore renewables uh, wind farm zone in the in the um in the Southern North Sea. Uh, and what we, I think the key bit, what we were enabled to do with these data is because we applied those techniques, we generated synthetic CPT predictions at all of the trace locations across the, the whole wind farm zone. We were then able to move away from that concept where the geophysical data just provides the structural model. So it just provides the thing seen on the top. We actually were able to generate this fully quantitative model that's spatially variable um, at a scale that's controlled by the geophysical data sampling. So if you've got 3D UHRS data, obviously that can be very, very dense, very high fidelity. If you, you know, most of that data these days is acquired at one by one meter bin or smaller, half by half meter bins becoming increasingly important, particularly in areas where boulders uh, are expected to be a hazard. Um, if it's 2D data, as the case was here, your cell size on your 3D model is going to be larger. In this case, it was 25 by 25 meters, but it's still a much higher fidelity model than you get by trying by just relying on those 1D uh, CPT locations. And importantly, again, coming back to that idea of, of understanding the uncertainties is you can build into that statistical uncertainties. So you can add into that uncertainties of the structural model, as well as uncertainties of on the predicted CPT tip resistance, for example. So in this case, you know, for example, we included uncertainty on on essentially the interpolation and how that dealt with the spacing between the lines. And so if you look in the bottom um, image here, you can see there's this large red blob 
well, that's an area where the uncertainty on the, the essentially the 3D interpolated structure was much higher because the line spacing in that area was much sparser. There was a met ocean buoy which we had, which the the survey geophysical survey had to steer around. So we can kind of importantly, we, it's not just about inverting the data and generating those predictions, but by capturing all the different layers of uncertainty and how they combine together throughout the project is quite important and, and stitching all of that together. Um, and then, of course, that can then be used by the engineers to do, you know, a variety of different things. So, for example, these data were used in this case to, to, to generate um, design parameters. So, sometimes quite simple high level design parameters like pile length diameter ratio um, and and map that out across the whole wind farm area that then so then that could be subdivided into zones so that you then could come up with a, a pile length diameter ratio that's appropriate for each of those zones alternatively particularly if we've got 3d data you know, and you've then got a you know a, a geotechnical a, a mapping at least of, of CPT tip resistance and sleeve friction at you know one meter trace spacing thirty to fifty centimeters vertical resolution. You're then at a scale where you could turn that into a finer element model and get into much more detailed modeling of your foundations, such as as was done as part of the PISA experiment, for example, and, and really you know push the envelope in terms of okay what that's telling you about how your foundation might design it kind of then it opens all sorts of doors for what you can do with that data but again a key point and it's something i keep coming back to is what's appropriate for each project you know this sort of large scale mapping across the whole wind farm zone was appropriate for this project because it was a design agnostic case study uh, um, but that's not true for all wind farm um, sites for all offshore renewable sites lots of them the actual layout of the wind turbines or the the um, etc are already um, predefined, and they're not really going to be adjusted based on the what we tell them from a, a, a geological ground model. Not significantly. In that case, we're more worrying about kind of local problems, so like the local variability in the ground conditions. So, and that actually becomes really important so if you think about the footprint associated with any engineering structures they're actually quite large you know a, a typical monopile foundation is in excess of 10 meters in diameter uh, if you're looking at, at uh, caissons suction caissons well quite often you will have uh, rigs where you've got several suction caissons um, all working together to support the overlying infrastructure um, and then you've got to think well you've also got to bring in your vessel to install that infrastructure. So, and certainly for shallow water cases, that's gonna be a jack up rig that wants to put spud cans down. So you then need to be thinking about, okay, well, what are the ground conditions beneath where those spud cans are going to sit on the, on the sea floor? So the area actually around that point on a map where you, you decided to put your infrastructure that you need to understand the local variability in ground conditions is several tens of meters and you know in lots of parts of the world across several tens of meters the geology and the ground condition can vary quite significantly the data i show on the screen here is from the southern north sea um, the vertical lines that I've put on there are 20 meter spaced lines. And if you look within that, you can see that, the, you know, within any two of those lines, there's lots of places within that 500 meter section of data where there is so quite, very, quite a lot of variation in structure across those 20 meters. And particularly where in your, your uh, the margins of some of those channel features, you could get a significant change in ground conditions across those, um, uh, you know, acro across the, that footprint. Um, and so then, you know, even if you go down the route of having a single intrusive geotechnical sample at each of those locations, how reliable that measurement is across your 50 meter footprint that you might be worried about is a very interesting question. So, you know, we can use the spatial, high spatial density of the geophysical data to help with that. So it's not just about being able to map over large areas. It's also about being able to understand local spatial variability as well. This is an example from a, a data in the North Sea where we were actually looking at 
multiple predictions across a across a, a spud can. So this isn't a foundation uh, diameter, but this is a, a spud can um, diameter. Um, but we we used multiple predictions across that spud can diameter to try and understand what the variability in the ground conditions was across that spud can. Um, and so in the, the synthetic CPT here, the red line is the best prediction of all of them and the various kind of dotted and dashed and dotted and, and dash dot lines in there are the various different predictions across that area. Uh, the shaded grey region is the best prediction based on, is, sorry, is the the um uncert is the uncertainty range based on the best prediction um but we can you know we can combine those different different predictions together in lots of different ways to try and understand that uncertainty on the potential range um and we can then pull that out and present it in different ways you know you can present it like this on a plot where you're you're looking at it as a shaded zone or you can pull that data out and, and present it as a histogram and a distribution um which we did here for the layer of interest which was this this slightly deeper clay layer the concern there was around about spud can punch through and essentially would the could, could that clay layer support the loading of the overlying sediments so um you know Again, we're using that high spatial density of the geophysical data to understand variability, not necessarily capturing a single value, but it's understanding that kind of range of possible parameters. What I would say, though, um, is that synthetic CPTs are not just the it's not that's not the only way of solving the problem, particularly if you can get at, at the elastic data. So if you can do um, uh, elastic impedance inversion or you can do full waveform inversion, then you can combine that data with rock physical and, and uh, soil properties models and look to try and, and, and actually apply physics to be able to get you from the, the physical properties, the geophysical properties towards your engineering properties. Um, this is an example where uh, we use that and we kind of, so coming full circle now, we're now back at kind of a gas saturation problem, so a free gas problem. Um, this case, it was from a, a gas sequestration experiment where we had time lapse data. And what we did is we combined geophysical inversion results with a uh, hierarchical Bayesian um, uh, rock physical model to, in the first phase, try and predict the uh, actual um, soil properties. So we predicted the porosity. Um, in the subsurface based on the, the, the geophysical parameters. And then by then feeding that in as a starting, uh, basically as prior information into the later phases of data when gas had been injected into the subsurface, we could then turn that into a prediction that, that looked at both the porosity and the gas saturation. So essentially the, the plot, the graphs you show on the right are showing the top layer is the, is the prior information, which is very broad starting model for the whole process. The second layer is basically showing you the data, the predictions from the um, the pre-gas injection state where we're predicting the porosity for two layers. We then and combine that with a gas saturation. And then the bottom layer is a prediction uh, of both the porosity in the two layers and the gas saturation for the um, um, output after gas had been injected into the subsurface. And, and this is a, comp a comparison of that data with some um, observations and geochemical data. So the red line on that plot is the observation. Um, and so you see that actually that's making quite a good prediction in terms of the, the, the likely volume of gas still in place in the subsurface. So it, it, in that case, it was working quite well. And another advantage as well is if you move, if you do look at alternative approaches, not just using machine learning and you start to leverage rock physics and soil mechanics as well, is that you can combine various different routes you could go through that. You can combine different approaches together and essentially use multiple methods all at the same, applied to the same, the same data or similar data to then try and validate, cross-validate the different approaches. So this is a is a different data set where we were trying to characterize gas saturation. Um, in red, we've taken an, an impedance inversion approach. In black, we've taken a, um, elast, a full waveform inversion approach going through Poisson's ratio to get gas saturation. And in orange, we've taken uh, a 
um, rock physical model based on Q estimates to get gas saturation. And what's quite nice is that they're all producing very similar results. Um, so we have pretty good, uh, we at least have, um, yeah, we have a fairly good confidence that the range of values being predicted is uh, sensible. So just to conclude, because I appreciate I've been waffling now for quite a long time. So um, just to pour, try and pull all of that together into some semblance of, of, of coherent thoughts, um, we've looked at multiple examples of how information derived from standard marine seismic reflection data can be translated into to parameters relevant to geotechnical engineers. Um, and we've done that at both early phase, high level information where we've looked at just simple things like separating out clay from sand layers to much later phase characterization where we've looked at predicting um, uh, uh, predicting more detailed engineering properties, getting at things like relative density or gas saturation, uh, a really in detail characterizing the subsurface, whether that's local variability or whether that's site-wide variability. I think if I was to say that take two take home points for that, I, I think if if people walk away from this and you only remember these two points, then I think they they would be firstly is that, that the engineering design is really is about managing risk. And so the aim for us as geophysicists, if we want to be able to support the engineers in doing that, is we need to be looking at uh, thinking about capturing the potential variability rather than trying to predict the specific value. And I've talked about that multiple times through the talk when talking about, you know, predicting parameter ranges. And I really do think that that's that's what we should be aiming for, not just not getting the best prediction out, but getting a good, reliable parameter range out. And, and secondly, I think I'd suggest uh, and I strongly suggest that, that don't see this as being a, a turnkey solution. Actually, I think it should be treated and the various things that I presented here are all kind of part of a flexible workflow or a, a kind of a toolbox full of various tools. Uh, and it's about taking each project on its own merits and looking for the right tools, we're combining them in the right way that is appropriate and produces the, the results which are are most useful for that particular project because you know it's you could turn around and say okay inversion synthetic CPTs for every project but not every project needs that not every project is it going to be possible and so there has to be a sense of realism and getting the most out of the most appropriate results out for each particular project and I think finally I just finish by saying that you know this has really been about trying to get the most out of geophysical data as it's currently acquired uh, obviously, if we carry on to improve that and that movement towards getting more 3D data, expanding our offset ranges, et cetera, that can only help uh, in uh, is getting better and more useful predictions moving forward. Um, and so on that note, I'll finish waffling and um, we can look at some questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. This was an awesome talk. And as we can see, we've got a couple of questions. Um, so the first question um, goes, um, I think is related to slide 10. So somebody asked, hi, how do you calculate QP? So yeah, so, okay, so there's a, a whole variety of different ways you can calculate QP. I think it's, uh, that's, that's probably the slide, yeah, that people talk about. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, a number of different ways you can calculate QP whether that's you know, um, um, spectral ratio method or uh, spectral matching um, the, or you know, peak frequency shift, et cetera. Um, what I would say is that the appropriate is that different data sets, the different methods are more reliable than others. Um, I think my preference generally is for spectral matching or spectral ratio. But um, peak frequency shift is, also has um, places, uh, as some data sets where it can work really uh, efficiently. Um, so I think it's a uh, QP can be a, a challenging parameter to get a handle on, but it, um, but it, I personally think it's a really useful one. Um, so I think taking time to try and do it is really um, is really valuable. I mean, what I would say is I think a lot of the instantaneous Q estimates that that people make i don't really put much faith in i think it's it's um i think yeah i, I think a, um 
the more kind of traditional spectral ratio and, and, and spectral matching approaches tend to be more tend to be more robust in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is actually more a comment and I think it refers to the same slide. Uh, slide. Somebody says, take care with the interpreted distribution of Q-factor distribution in the SBT chart. You've posted data in order of Q, so low values may be covered up. Um, maybe you can comment on that? I think what they're meaning is that some data points are sitting on top of others. Um, is what I think they're talking about there. So um, I think, um, yeah, I, you do have to be careful and make sure that you're not hiding, that the, you're seeing a trend that's not there um, because of the way it's, it's being plotted. Um, I think what I would say is I've looked at these plots in various different ways, looking at both just plotting points, colour points, but also looking at um, distributions and um, heat maps and you know, you, yeah, you know, uh, analysing it in lots of different ways. And I'm I'm pretty comfortable with those sorts of relationships we're seeing there um, and that we're talking about. Um, I think they're, um, you know, I think probably the biggest, I think the biggest uncertainty in terms of that relationship actually is the scatter on the, the geophysical parameters as they're estimated, particularly Q, because your uncertainties on your Q estimate tend to be quite large. So um, I think that's probably the bigger uh, issue. But again, you can factor that in. You know, if you can get an uncertainty on your Q estimate, then you can use that when if you're then say coming on to the next slide and you're looking at you know trying to separate between a, a loose and a and a medium dense sand for example if you've got estimates on on your on your variability of your queue well you can plot that and take factor that in when you're trying to classify your um your soil as a as a different densities of sand mm -hmm. Um, the next question goes into the direction of the machine learning part. I think you, you covered this later on, but somebody's asking, so when you're talking about machine learning, uh, do you mean some type of neural networks application? Yeah, I mean, so there's a whole ra raft of different machine learning techniques that can be applied. I mean, we've used uh, random forests, we've used um, support vector machines, and we've used neural networks of various forms. Um, again, it is all about what's... Uh, I do think it's a project by project thing and it's about not just about kind of the input data but it's also thinking about what you're wanting to get out of it you know if you're wanting to do for example classification um, then as I showed on uh, this slide for example you know the random forest will will produce a much uh, faster and robust result than say using a, a neural network for classification um so yeah it's about what you're wanting to do so i think yeah it's choosing the right tool the features for um, machine learning can include both location how do you yeah, so the, the, the question about so um the so in terms of so that yeah, like right, let's try and break that down because there's various questions there. Um so do so do the machine learning features include depth and location um sometimes yes sometimes not it does depend very much so there are you know different sites when we would use um when we would potentially include depth below sea floor as a parameter um some sites you don't um location again can be used uh, and, and for some sites it's useful for other sites it's, it's not um part of the part of the process and tuning the approach is looking at all of the different parameters you could put into it and deciding which ones are most appropriate i mean for example you know you can you could feed into your um uh part of the machine learning inputs could be the 
the unitization, so the geological unitization. Mm -hmm. So you could feed your structural modeling, but you don't have to. And actually for the predictions I'm showing on screen at the moment, the only geological unitization we put in in this case was, so actually in these data around about 30 meters depth, there's a transition. Um, so this is the Southern North Sea and, and 30 meters and below is the, the Yarmouth Roads formation, which is a very, very stiff, very, very stiff sand. So it's a, it's a sorry, very, very dense sand. Um, and it's, it's geolo geotechnically very different from the material above it. So in these data, we didn't put all of the different structural units in, but we did put in a distinction between those two, what was above the Yarmouth Roads and what was in the Yarmouth Roads. Um, in terms of splitting the data set to avoid information in between locations when we evaluate the model, will we that all comes to handling the data. So we have, you know, you basically marry up your seismic data with your um, geotechnical data each location and, and make sure that you kind of keep track of, you know, w which input data sets are coming from which location so that you can then prevent, you know, essentially um, you know, mm -hmm. prevent leakage of data between mm -hmm. locations and, and make sure that you are, um, if you're doing a leave one out analysis, you really are leaving all of the data out from that particular location. Um, you can, you know, you can use your analysis as part of the input as well, or you will use one of so that you can support all the gaps and you know, so sometimes it is, it's also guided uh, machine learning. Um, I think, um, could the quality prediction in one out depend on correlated is with depth through nearby CPTs? Um, yes, absolutely. You're, um, you do, you know, as, and I think it has to be, it has to be understood that you, there is no fast track route through this. If, if you're going down, particularly if you're going to look at, you know, generating synthetic CPTs, or even if you're not doing synthetic CPTs and you're going to try and use the geophysics physics to go from your geophysical parameters to your engineering parameters you have to have a good agreement between your um so you know your your geotechnical sample locations have to be near your ideally coincident uh, coincident with your geophysical data there's no point trying to marry up geophysical data with geotechnical data that's 30 meters away because funnily enough you're going to have a problem um, and the same is true in terms of your time to depth relationship. So all of that work that's done as standard almost in interpreting the, the building your geological structural model, interpreting your fascist boundaries, tying that in with your geotechnical data, that has to still be done and has to be done at a good level to underpin all of this. Um, but some of the things that we were, show, you know, we showed on, you know, previous slides so some of you know this work here where you're using that high level impedance and cue and looking at variability between where are your sand layers and where are your your clay layers that can help you do that so for example the data shown here at the bottom where we were we're tying actually in this case we're tying hull mounted pinger seismic data with a borehole one of the key validations we used in that to get our to make sure that our time to depth relationship was correct because it was a whole amount of pinger so we didn't have offsets to get really good velocities was to use q and the and the essentially the the tie points the old school kind of check shot style approach to tie between your clay rich cohesive layers and your sand rich granular layers so absolutely you do need to get that correlation with depth done done well Thank you. Um, next presentation. Um, was the next question? At the time to calculate the synthetic CBTs from seismic data, how much does the seismic data resolution affect the final uh, results? So, um, afternoon, Alba. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, the uh, yeah the. Um, yes, it does. It definitely affects the results. Your I do I. Um, in some of these talks previously, I've shown examples where we've done predictions with lower frequency data. Um, I mean, the, the fundamentally, you are limited by the resolution of your seismic data. You cannot get, you know, if your seismic data is 50 centimeter resolution, you're not going to see a five centimeter thick layer. 
Um, so your um, you are you it, it does fundamentally limit the resolution at which you can predict some of the structure. And so if you look at this image on the right here and you see some of the some of the thinner layers that the the that the machine learning prediction is just not capturing. You know, some of that is quite clearly down to the difference in resolution between the two different data sets. So that does have, you do have to bear that in mind. Um, and so that does come into a point in terms of what's the most appropriate data for your, um, for your um, project. Next question I have is, Oh, it's not. I have two questions. So, um, uh, which methodology do you really use to estimate your field and studies? Um, and if you have a question, please do it from Jesse Davin. And how do you supervise the risk estimation by retaining the HR detail? And how do you? I think that I will need to get certain details. So that in terms of methods to estimate Q values, we took, uh, kind of talked about that a bit before. I mean, so we use, um, you know, I mean, I think I would most commonly use a, a spectral ratio, spectral matching method is the, is the most most regular one I would use. Um, um, the you know, stabilization, um, I mean, so you can do, um, so you, you can do trace trace stabilization of them um uh, again it depends very much on the data and how um, um and how you know how noisy it is how hard it is to calculate um in terms of confidence on the extracted q fields i think i have pretty good confidence on the on the extracted q fields in most circumstances partly because of the way we pitch the uh, the way we pitch the estimation enables us to get some level of, of estimate of the uncertainty. So again, I, I, it's, a, it's a drum I've banged a lot today, but I would definitely say, um, you know, again, it's about predicting the range of values, not necessarily the, the single value. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the, uh, the next question, uh, uh, Jeff Hall from Back the um, well, I, mean, I think that varies. That uh, that varies, but I mean, it's, it's becoming increased. So, if you're doing the full, so if you're doing the full site, um, so these sorts of full site ground models, like we see here, I mean, they are, you know. They are vast models, um, and even when you bin them at 25 by 25 meters, they are um, significant. Um, um, you know that they're, that's that's they're significant models. Um, I mean, I think realistically, the only way of interrogating these models at the moment, from a kind of a software perspective, is to use uh, like an. Um, standard kind of exploration industry 3d seismic interpretation package so uh, you know a, a patrol or a kingdom or a dug in site or open detect uh, and essentially load them in as 3d volumes to to interact with uh, within those um i mean i think you know they, they can be they can be manipulated and interrogated on standard workstations um but you're talking you know they they if they're even if they're saved as a seg y file you're talking um, tens of gigabytes uh, in size, uh, even at those low resolutions. Yeah, I mean, if you were to try and do this with a, you know, full site UHRS 3D data, you'd be talking uh, uh, terabytes of data probably, which is why I'm not sure full site mm -hmm. 3D is going to ever really answer the questions that uh, necessarily people are thinking. I, I suspect full site 3D UHRS for this sort of problem will probably actually generate more data than can be physically handled rather than a, so probably cause more problems than than, than solutions mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, we have a couple of notes here that uh, we thank for the presentation under the group and we have a couple of more questions. So from then uh, it looks like this way information would be useful for this type of Logistically, this would be challenging on driver of positions. Does this effectively rule out the safety of using the 
can still give benefits to start with increased costs and uh, compensate them to yeah, I mean, I think certainly there is a, there's lots of benefits. If you could get S wave data, um, then certainly it would help. I mean, obviously, you know, the, I guess the key point is that you know, shear waves are more sensitive to the to the grain skeleton properties of the grain skeleton, the behaviour of the grain skeleton, and fundamentally, that's really what the what the engineering design is kind of driven by that those those soil mechanical properties so so shear waves certainly would would help um i mean in terms of cost benefit and whether it's useful i don't think it's yeah you know, i mean realistically doing a, a, a like an active shear wave survey over a, a, a full offshore wind farm site um i don't quite i don't see how it's tractable given the scale of some of these sites but as I kind of talked about um, later on, you know, I talked about, you know, it's not always about these sorts of, you know, large scale. Um, sometimes it, it can be about mm. looking at, at local variability and capturing the local conditions. And so, you know, I think if there's, if there are, you know, approaches that can be, uh, that can get active shear mm. wave data on small areas that are targeting particular trouble, particular problem sites, whether that's, you know, a particular wind far, wind turbine location, whether that's the OSS location, whether it's a particularly difficult part of the cable route because you're expecting a, you know, a significant change in ground conditions across there and you want to really understand that. Um, then I th personally, I think absolutely you could use shear wave, active shear wave acquisition in those sorts of targeted problems. Um, so I, I uh, yeah, I wouldn't rule it out personally. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, this is Jeff Bell. Uh, two last questions. Uh, does the overall method selection depend on the size of the data set? And uh, second, is the modeling method dependent on the type of soil material? Yes, yeah, so it's so in terms of the first question. Um, yes, definitely, it's uh, it's depends on the size of the data set. Um, you, um, I mean, the, the whole point of the, the machine learning, and so one of the limitations of machine learning is that your um, um, your training data set has to be um representative of the of the overall ground conditions so if your training data set isn't representative of the overall ground conditions then then you you, you can struggle in terms of um of being able to get a good prediction from it um but in time to leave one out actually can be really useful in identifying which particular which sites are really key in terms of capturing all the ground conditions so i think i highlighted in one of the slides were that the, there's a there was a layer that wasn't present in other in the other sites and therefore it wasn't really predicted well um in that that leave one out so um definitely that it, it, it does it does depend on the data set size um, and you'll see different i guess different bits of behavior and different data set size but that's why i guess i would always argue you can do the site-wide statistics and that's useful to a point, but I think you also do need to look at the detailed analysis at, at each site as well. Um, and in terms of the modeling methods, um, I'm not quite sure which modeling method they're talking about, but I mean, I guess the point of, I was like, presumably they're talking about the machine learning. I mean, the whole point, so part of the point of trying to, um, uh, of, I guess part of the point of that whole process would be to be able to separate out, uh, identify which layers are clay and which layers are sand. And that would be a fundamental part of it. So we've got time for one more question. Um, it starts with a comment. So you mentioned the source receiver limitation and current acquisition as 100 meters. And then the question is, will not larger offsets for shallow subsea beds take your reflection data beyond the critical angle and no longer I guess provide the reflections. Um, I guess yes, in, in very shallow water. Um, the um, but then we're you know we're seeing in offshore renewables a push towards deeper and deeper water sites now. So 
I don't necessarily see that as being a problem. Uh, I mean, to a certain extent as well, getting large offset data that gets post-critical energy um, is a benefit because if you can go post-critical and you can start to, you can get to the point where you're rec recording refracted arrivals, then that in its own right can be extremely useful in terms of building velocity models, which then makes time to depth conversion easier, which makes processing easier. You know, there's lots of advantages actually for that. Um, yes, it means you have to potentially think a bit more carefully about how you're generating your angle gathers, for example. Um, but uh, I'd rather have that problem than not have that problem, I think, is my honest answer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark, uh, for an excellent presentation and very enthusiastic, enthusiastic presentation and uh, question and session. So very, very good. And um, I guess we can close on this note and uh, I'm saying by saying that again, one of the main benefits, one of the main points that we brought in is not only to use geophysics data in addition to other measurements uh, in an um, integrated approach. And so look not only on specific values, but also on the potential variability of these values to give a sense to, uh, to the risk and uh, to measurements for uh, installation purposes. So very good. Uh, we finish on this note. And uh, thank you again for your presentation. Good. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you to uh, um, Aurelian and uh, Emin and SEG for the invite and for, for chairing. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.